Well, three weeks. Yep. Okay. It is recording now, so let's start. Good. All right. I'm going to mute everyone. Oh, Jesus, I'm sorry. We're all muted now. I don't know. Boom. Quiet now. All right. So unmuting them. And where's Carolee? Where'd she go? Okay. Um, but I, you can hear me, right, Karen? Yep. But I lost Carolee. I, she was having technical difficulties this morning. I wonder if she I, got. I can. Off. I can see. Can you hear oh, me? Oh, there you are. You okay. Sorry. I wanted to make you a co-host. Okay. There you go. All right. So, um, welcome everybody. I'm going to um, move on and introduce you to our co-host today, Brian Heffernan, and he will introduce our host for today. And here they are. So Brian, you want to start? As most of you know, this is my mom, Julie Heffernan, who is a teacher at the Cochrane Museum, which is why she's doing this screen cast because it's about her work. It is. So Brian and I have been I'm home doing a lot of fun projects this these last few months. And we do a lot of history. We like to read history books and biographies. And then we started talking about this man named Daniel Chester French. And um, when we talked about him, we it, it made us go on a couple of little field trips and we took some pictures that we're going to share with you. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to share my screen. We're going to tell you a little bit about Daniel Chester French's life. And then we're going to look at some pictures together and I need your input. I need you to take a look at these pictures and tell me what you see. But first we want to tell you the story about this man. So I'm going to share my screen first. Okay, let's see. Uh, multiple participants can share simultaneously. Let's see, am I doing this right? Karen, do you I see? I think you just go to share screen. You hit okay. that green button. Okay. And, and then you click. I don't think you want to share. Well, you do want to share computer sound. So you click that button. How about that? You Does click that... share. Do you see? Uh, now I can't see it though. You are screen sharing. Dan, why can't I see it? So Dan's here too. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm here. Can you still hear me? Yeah. But shit, stop video, mute. Uh, wait, wait. Do you see the uh, PowerPoint, Karen? We so see your desktop. I see your entire um, <laughs> desktop. You have the PowerPoint open? Huh? Oh. You have to open the PowerPoint. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. K K Sharon, Karen. Yeah. Do you still have the PowerPoint on your computer? Um, I, yeah, I have to find it in an email, though. All right, so stop sharing your because screen. I'm using a different computer than the one I did the PowerPoint on. I forgot that step. I'm oh, so okay. sorry. Okay. All right, okay. so stop sharing your screen. Okay. And I will go. So just give me a minute, folks, because I'm. I gotta I, go I through my emails. Yeah. No, I don't have it. Karen. On. All right. So, so I, I just sent it to Karen. So she's she probably can get it quicker than I can. Yeah. Yeah. I just I'm so sorry. Me. That's okay. All right. Okay. So let's see. Why was why is this thing not moving? So the last one you sent to me, uh huh. I'm looking for, okay, this must be it, the one with the attachment. Okay. Well, so now you might have to be the one to an, a, advance it, yes? Or could yeah, I? That's fine. That's okay. fine. Great. Um, can people see it? Can you raise your hand if you can see it? Yes, it's there. Oh, good. It says, yes, it okay. All right. Perfect. Um, I'm trying to see if I can make it a bigger screen, but I don't think I can. So, so yeah. Oh, bummer. Okay. If you, you, if you use that square up top, Karen, will that make it full screen? Next oh, to the oh, X. Oh. There it is. There. Thank you, Carolee. 
Can you all see that well enough? Yep, I can, can you thumbs up if you can see it, guys? Okay. That's good. All right. Good. So, um, you know what? Do you know my password for my computer, honey? No, I don't need to do this. I'm just so oh. you just tell me yeah. you where you want me to advance. I know. Karen, do you see where it says above Lincoln's, uh, above the head start slideshow? Can you do yes. that? Try yeah. that. Oh, good. This is great. So we're going to talk about statues today. And they've been in the news a lot lately, which is one of the reasons Brian and I started talking about them. But Karen, could you advance to the next slide for us? Mm -hmm. This is the statue we're going to start with. So I'd like to hear from you all. You can raise your hand and Karen can call on you. But who, what can, can anybody tell me anything about this statue? Does anybody recognize this man? Um, Patty? That's Leakin. You're absolutely right. Do, does anybody know anything else about this statue? Uh, Nolan? What I know about this statue is that it sits in Washington, D.C., and he's an important figure as a president. Yes. Yes, absolutely. At the Lincoln Memorial, so in Washington, D.C. Can you raise your hand if you've seen this in person? How many of you have gone to Washington, D.C. and seen this in person? Yeah, that millions of people see it every year. It's probably one of the most famous statues in our country. But what I want to tell you today is this statue was made by a man named Daniel Chester French. And he is from, he's a New Hampshire boy and a Massachusetts boy. So we're gonna tell you the story about Daniel Chester French today. So Karen, could you go to the next slide, please? Sure. So we have a couple of pictures that we're gonna use from this book. It's called Monument Maker. And as you see, they picture Lincoln's, the Lincoln Memorial statue here. But down at the bottom, you'll see that it's illustrated by Sean fields. And there are a couple of his pictures that are really wonderful. So Brian and I wanted to include them in our talk. So Karen, could you um, go to the next slide, please? Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a picture of Daniel Chester French or a drawing of him. And as I said, he was born in New Hampshire. He lived in New Hampshire for 10 years in Exeter, New Hampshire, where his family had a farm. And then when he was 10 years old, they moved to the Boston area because his dad was a lawyer and was opening a law office in Boston. So at first, they lived in Cambridge. For a number of years, they lived in Cambridge. And Daniel Chester French was born in April of 1950. They moved to Cambridge when he was about 10 years old. And that was the same year that Lincoln was um, elected president. And as you probably remember from your history classes, there was a lot of fighting going on between the North and the South, a lot of arguing. The yeah. South wasn't happy about, what was about how the North felt about slavery, among other issues. So 10-year-old Daniel Chester French heard a lot of this conversation at his dinner table in Cambridge. And then on his 11th birthday, the war started on his 11th birthday. And again, the family talked about that a lot because his brother, was serving in, in the war. So they really followed it closely. But one other thing I should tell you about Daniel Chester French, he loved working on the farm up in New Hampshire, loved being outdoors, explored, looked at animals, looked at trees, and he drew. He loved to draw. He would draw pictures of all the birds that he saw. Um, and so then they came to Cambridge and he continued drawing, but he also made some good friends. But then, when he was 15, two things happened. One, the war ended, but a couple of days later, as you probably remember, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. So again, lots of talking about that. But also, Daniel Chester French's family moved out to Western Massachusetts, to the Berkshires. And I know some of you spend a lot of time in the Berkshires. So now the family is um, at the Berkshires. And he missed his friends. He had lots of fun places to walk around and nature to see. He drew a lot of drawings, but because he missed his friends, he spent his time reading and he read a lot of Greek myths. And then he ended up drawing a lot of the pictures of the gods and goddesses of the Greek myths. And then the end of the story that I'm going to tell you is then when he was 17 years old, 
his family moved back to the Boston area. They moved to Concord, Massachusetts. And his dad became a judge. His dad was a judge, but they had a small family farm. And this drawing is supposedly a picture of Daniel, the teenager on the family farm. And he would farm the asparagus and he had his own strawberry patch and he tended the cows, but his family thought he should go to college. So he went to MIT for just one semester and he didn't like it. And he came home and he worked on the family farm in Concord and he was thinking to himself, what am I going to do? There are a lot of judges and lawyers in my family and I do not want to do that. So what am I going to do? And, and in Concord as a whole as well. And in Concord as a whole, there were a lot of lawyers in Concord as a whole, Brian said, yeah. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. Oh, oh, can you go back here? And I forgot to show something. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this one thing, so that the piece of um, the vegetable that he has in his hands right here, you can't really tell, is it's a turnip. And he's making this motion with his hand. He's got his finger up in the air. What do you think that means as he looks at the turnip? What do you think that means when you go, aha? Chris, you have an idea? Was he looking for ice to create a statue? Is that what he was thinking about? You're close, you're close. He, he didn't plan to do that, but he put his finger up and he said, aha, this turnip looks like something. This turnip really reminds me of something. So Karen, turn the, to the next slide. And the turnip is over on the left. And if you look at the bottom of the turnip, do you see how this, it has a split root at the bottom? And he yeah. was looking at that and he said, that really reminds me of something. So he took out his knife, his pocket knife, and he started carving. And at the end, what did he make out of that turnip with the split root? Anybody see what it is? What's the picture on the right? What does that look like to you? Dan? A frog? Absolutely, it looks like a frog. And he put that on the family kitchen table and he went upstairs to wash up for dinner. And when he came down, his family was looking at it and they said, this is really good. This looks like a frog. It looks like you might have some talent. So his dad went out and brought 10 pounds of um, clay home. And Dan, at age 17, 18, started sculpting with clay. And he loved doing it. And he just really thought, um, enjoyed doing it and was getting better. Now, how many of you have heard the name Louisa May Alcott? Nope. Have you heard the name? She's an author. Do you remember what yep. book she wrote? She Little wrote Women. Right. Her most famous book is Little Women. Now, for those of you who have read the book or seen one of the movies, she had yep. a sister, the Little Women was based on her life, and she had a sister who was a really good artist. Do you remember who, which sister that was? Does anybody remember her name? Right? Amy. Amy. Yeah. Amy. But in real life, Louisa May Alcott had a sister who was an artist, and her name was May. In real life, her name was May. And she saw Daniel's frog, and she said, that is really good. So he went to see May Alcott three times a week that he would get drawing lessons. She said, if you, if you want to be a sculptor, you have to know how to draw. So she gave him drawing lessons for a while, three times a week. And then when he got better, he started to take the train into Boston, and he took more drawing lessons with a doctor who also was an illustrator who would draw, but the doctor knew a lot about anatomy. Um, does anybody know what anatomy is? This was very important for Dan to learn. What's anatomy? Like operate? Well, you do need to know an, a, anatomy to operate. It's what the body looks like, what the parts of the body look like inside and out. And so he studied anatomy um, and that helped him get an idea of, uh, of what the bodies looked like when he was making sculptures. So I think Karen, we can go to the next slide, please. All right. So you probably have heard about Concord, Massachusetts in another way. What do any of you remember from your history classes, from your school classes about Concord, Massachusetts? It has a famous, it's an important part of our nation's history. 
you remember what war started there? The Revolutionary? Bingo, yes. The Revolutionary War started there back in April 1775. But Daniel Chester French was living in the mid-1800s, and his town of Concord was saying, oh my goodness, in five years, it's going to be the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Concord, and that's a big deal, and we want to plan a big celebration, and as part of our big celebration, we want to have a statue. We want to have a statue right there where the, where the battle took place. And so they had a committee, and the committee was going to talk to different people who might make a statue, and they said, send us your ideas, and we'll make a decision. So Daniel made dozens of little clay statues, trying to figure out what he would make a statue to look like. And he, you know, sometimes when you see military statues, they're of important generals, or they might be up on horses, and they might have all their military equipment with them. And he thought, no, I don't want to do that. I want to make a statue that looks like everybody, because it was the farmers who came out. It was all the local farmers who came out and were part of the militia and the Minutemen. And so I want a statue that looks like them, that, that honors all the, all the Minutemen. And so he showed his family, that's what this picture is. He showed his family his favorite four, and then he asked them to pick one. And they picked the same one that he liked. And so he submitted that, he sent that, took that model to the committee. And they said, yes, that's the statue we choose. And he'd never made a statue before. This was his first public statue. But they said, you know, he's a local boy. He was in his early 20s. And they said, let's go with this. We're going to use a local boy to make this statue. And so he won the contest. And this was still, he had about four or five years to work on this. Um, so he put a lot of effort into it. So we'll go to the next slide and see what it looks like. All right. How many of you have seen this one? I bet some of you have been to this statue. Raise your hand if you've been here. Yeah, I see a couple hands. People couple have been hands. there. That's great. So this is this is the Minuteman statue, and it's in Concord. And um, Brian and I went out to take some pictures of it. It's funny. Brian has a Patriots um, mask on, so we didn't plan that. But it's funny that he's wearing a Patriots mask <laughs> while we're talking about these early Patriots. But it's hard to see. The pictures aren't really big, but. There are a couple of things. So tell me, do you notice anything about the statue? What do you see? Does he look like a military general? Does he look like a regular guy? What does he have with him? What's he holding? A gun. A long gun. A, a rifle, I mean. Yeah, that's a good observation. And it's funny because they were fighting the British soldiers, the British regulars who had fancy military equipment. But the farmers who came out, they just brought their guns from home, their muskets, the ones they used for farming and hunting. But you're right, that's a picture of what they have. What else do you see in here? Do you see anything else? I see Adam. Adam, what do you see? But uh, um, I know mm, this guy used to be in one of the films that I just watched, which is the uh, Minute Man. How's the same thing that I know he, he was appearing as a type of um, thing? Um, the man, it, it was called as a from the um, Films, which is the Amendment Man, has the uh, type of the famous uh, statue man who yeah. just moved his arms like arm above his arms like they're up and down. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And you're right, the name is Minute Men, and that's because. They weren't professional soldiers. They were just doing their jobs, lots of them farmers. But when they heard there was trouble, they could be ready in a minute. But because, so look at this statue a little bit. He does have a gun in one hand, but what's he walking away from? What's he putting, leaving behind? Do you recognize that piece of equipment? It's a piece of farming equipment. It's a plow. It's his plow for a field. And he's walking away from his plow, and he's walking away from his field, and he's going to fight at this battle. And you can see his, on the, his back, you see his powder horn with his gunpowder. 
and you see his coat draped over that. You see his sleeves are rolled up. He's a hard worker. And I will say on the other side of this statue, there was a very famous author and poet, we're gonna talk about him in a second, named Ralph Waldo Emerson. And he lived in Concord. He's probably the most famous person who lived in Concord. And he wrote for this anniversary, he wrote a special hymn, a special poem that they sung at the celebration. But one of the verses is, is written on the other side of this statue. And it has the very famous line about the shot heard round the world. You've probably heard that sign, you've heard that, that sentence before. That came from Ralph Waldo Emerson's poem and it's, it's um, engraved on the statue. Okay, so Karen, I think, unless there are any questions, does anybody have any questions about this? Chris does. Chris? Dan has a question. Well, the guy who was holding on the gun, he was holding on a, he, I think he was getting away from, from danger. That's what he was getting away from when you were told. Well, I think he was gonna go join his friends and help defend their town against the British soldiers who were marching there. Yeah, 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 I, yeah, yeah. He was, he, he, he was, he was, he, he, I think he was gonna ambush the British. He was gonna ambush the British. On the way back. After the battle, when the British were trying to get back to Boston, the colonists ambushed them all the way back. And, and the British didn't know what to make of it because they weren't used to that kind of fighting. They were not used to for that, that surprise attack, you mean. Exactly. Exactly. Ben, you want to call on him? Bardeen. Uh, Scott, call him by his first name, Ben. <laughs> can you unmute oh. Ben? Can you un can you unmute Ben? Oh me? No, him. Oh, okay. I, I know Brian for a long I, I know Brian for a long time, Brian, but Julie, it's fine. I, I I I don't mind if Gardine is fine here. <laughs> so did you have um, a question, yes. Ben? Yeah, yes. Um so in in so one of my favorite things in, in in history was when 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 I learned about Thomas Paine. Do you know anything about Thomas Paine? Well, the the about the book that he wrote. Right, Common Sense. Yes. Yeah, there were lots of patriots involved way back when, weren't there? Yes, there was. I love it. Yeah, I do too. All right, so we're going to move to this next slide. And do you remember I hey, said I just said yeah. that there was this poet who lived in town, Ralph Waldo Emerson. This is a bust of Emerson. What, what, a bust is a kind of statue. What does it mean if you say a bust? Do you know what kind of statue? It only has the person from what? From their shoulders up, right? From their like chest, their neck and up. So this is a bust of Emerson. And Emerson was a, one of Daniel Chester French's neighbors. And he Boston was a Med. very famous author. Oh, I see one of you. He wrote essays. He gave a lot of lectures. He started a, a philosophical group called the Transcendentalists who changed the way they thought about religion a little. They thought religion was in nature and there was divinity, there was God in everyone. Um, and so, but, and he, as I said, wrote the poem that's on the Minuteman statue. But he was friends with Daniel Chester French. So Daniel Chester French went over to his house. This was when he was still in his 20s. Daniel Chester French was still in his 20s. He went over every day for a month and they sat and they talked and he made models of Emerson's face and he made this sculpture. And I took this picture. This is in the Concord Museum where I work and where I teach. And um, so I see people looking at this and a lot of people who study Emerson come into the museum to look at this and they say, wow, that looks more like him than any other picture or sculpture that we have. And the story that I like about it is that when Daniel Chester French was done with this and he showed it to Emerson and he said, well, what do you think? I'm done, what do you think? And Emerson looked at him and he said, Dan, that is the face that I shave. It looks so much like him. He said, that is the face that I see. So this is a very popular, and it's such a well-known statue that lots of copies of this have been made. Um, for example, um, there's one in the Concord Library too, and I think that one's made out of marble, but you can find it lots of different places. Hmm. So, okay, Karen, we can go to the next one. Oh, okay. So here's another statue of his in Concord. And this one, now we're gonna move wars. We're gonna switch from the Revolutionary War to the Civil War. 
And I'll tell you a little bit about this statue and then I want you to look at the picture and tell me what you notice about the statue. But this statue is called the Melvin Memorial. And that is because during the Civil War, there was a family in Concord, their last name was Melvin, and all four of their sons went off to fight in the war. Um, I have to look up their names, make sure I tell you them in order. Their names were um, Amos, excuse me, Asa, John, Samuel, and the youngest one was James. And so the three oldest boys died in the Civil War. Um, one of them died in the camp waiting to go to battle. He got sick, he got that stomach dysentery, he got very sick and he died in battle. Another one was captured. He hadn't even fought, but he was captured after he took somebody, an injured soldier to the back. And they had him march all the way from Virginia to, uh, to Georgia to a really terrible prison camp called Andersonville. And he was starving and he really suffering and he was there for months. And we know this, he wrote a beautiful diary. He wrote in it every day, um, but he died. He ended up dying in, down in Georgia at the prison camp. And then while he was there, before he died, he met some soldiers from his other brother's company. And they said, you know, your brother was shot through the heart in a battle at Petersburg. So one brother died before they, in, mm -hmm. you know, just the camp before they went to fight. One was captured, died as a prisoner of war, and then one died in battle. But the youngest one, James, had, he was very, very young, just a teenager, and he joined just at the end of the war. So he didn't get hurt, and he came home to Concord, but he missed his older brothers so much, his big brothers. And he didn't have any money or anything back then, but he said, one day, one day I'm gonna earn a lot of money, and I'm gonna make a statue to my brothers, to memorialize my brothers. Um, and so he be, got into business and he became a very successful businessman in Boston. And years later, when he was an older man, he asked his childhood friend, Daniel Chester French, if he would make this monument. And so this is in the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in Concord. And the other name for, oh, and you can see at the bottom, the bottom picture, do you see those three gray rectangles that look the same at the bottom, at the base of this, the monument? Mm -hmm. Those are his three brothers, one for Asa, one for John and one for Samuel. But look at the monument itself. What do you notice about this, the figure of, of the, on the monument? Can you make any guesses about what that is? What that's supposed to symbolize? Dan has a guess. You wanna unmute Dan? Um, so Julia, does that, um, Melvin Memorial, does that look like a, a, a statue? It does look like a statue and it's a woman. You can tell it's a woman and she represents victory. She oh, represents victory. Oh, oh, I've been to New York once and I saw the Statue of Liberty. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Okay, that's similar, yeah. You know, speaking of New York, um, Daniel Chester French made a copy of this very statue to put in the museum, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. But in that one, he has her looking the other way. It's funny. They changed the way she's looking here because of the way the sunlight would shine on it in the, um, in the cemetery. But let me tell you this. So she's, she's, now it's called mourning victory, but see how mourning is spelled? It's with the U. It's the other meaning of mourning. So if you're mourning somebody, what does that mean? This kind of mourning. If you're mourning somebody who has died, what does that no, mean? Nolan, you want to unmute Nolan? Nolan, you want to unmute? We'll do. Got it. <clears throat> what does that mourning mean, Nolan? It means that it's sadness and grief. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Grief is a perfect word for mm -hmm. it, right? Right. And let me ask you all another question. So this is, this woman is supposed to represent victory and she's coming out, she's emerging, she's victory. And she has a very important piece of fabric draped over her head. And if we were seeing this in person, you'd see that there are some stars carved on it up near the top and on the side. Can you guess what this fabric is that she's stepping out from underneath with the stars on it? The fabric of time. If you looked closely, there might even be some stripes on it. Anybody get a guess? A what big important piece of fabric has stars and stripes? Ben Bardeen? Ben Bardeen? Nope. The American flag. Absolutely. She's stepping up. Yeah, Ben! <laughs> and you know, James, the younger brother, lived a long life, but when he died at an old age, 
He was buried right nearby. He was buried right near his big brothers. And I can also say a fun yet sad fact is speaking about Lincoln, Andrew at the same time as Leo Def, as the brothers deaths in the White House, his son Willie died from the same illness Asa died from. Right. Brian wants you to know that Willie Lincoln had dysentery, which is the same thing that Asa Melvin died from. Okay, so here we're going to go to the next statue, and I think some of you are going to recognize it. I, I think I will. How many of you have seen this statue? Does anybody have, have you seen this one? I'll give you a hint. It's in Cambridge. I'll give you another hint. It's on a college campus. Brendan Durkin, want to unmute? Brendan? Brendan, do you have a guess who this is? I thought he had his hand up. So it says at the bottom, this man is John Harvard. And people say, oh, John Harvard, he's the founder of Harvard University. And well, yes, but he's one of a few founders. It was a group of people who founded Harvard University, but they named it after him because he donated a lot of money and he gave the university, which was just starting, he gave them 400 of his books. He had scholarly books and he gave them all to Harvard to start their library. And John Harvard was born in 1607 and died 30 years later. He only lived to 30 years old, um, but he was a minister. And if you look at his clothes, that's what a minister would look like in the colonial time. Um, if you go see this in person, you'll, you'll notice that he looks like a colonist with his clothing. And underneath his chair, um, he has some books. And I think they put the books there because he's a, you know, because it's a university where you study. But I think they probably put the books there too because he donated so many books to the college to start the college. But here's the funny thing about this statue of John Harvard. It doesn't look like him. Do you know why? Nobody had a picture of him. Nobody made a drawing of him. So when the university asked Daniel Chester French to make a statue of him, he said, I don't know what he looks like. So this was in the 1800s, later in the age, a long, you know, 200 years later. So he thought, huh, what am I going to do? So he went to the university and he said, I am interested in having one of your students pose for this statue. And so he picked a student who was famous, but the last name was H-O-A-R, Hoare. And that, that student had an uncle who had been a president of the university. And he had an uncle who signed, you know, an ancestor who signed the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And this student's father was on the board of directors. So they asked him to pose and sit for this. So this is actually a statue of a student who went to Harvard. Um, what's his first name? His first name is Sherman, Sherman Hoare um, in the 1800s. But two things about this, you can't really see it because Dan's hand's blocking it. But there's a, there's a myth that if you rub John Harvard's left foot, you'll get good luck. And so if you walk up and you see this statue in person, his left foot looks a little shinier than the other one because everybody rubs it for good luck. But that's not, it's not a real thing. People just made that up. Tour guides made that up for something to tell tourists. But <laughs> what is true is that when graduating seniors walk by this statue, they take off, remember those hats you wear at graduation, those mortar boards? They take off their hats when they walk by this on their graduation day. So, but this is right in Harvard Yard, right? And so the next time you're in Cambridge, if you want to walk through Harvard Yard, you can see this statue. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, we can go on to the next. Oh, oh. Does, does, does Naz have a question? Oh, okay. Do you want to unmute Sanaz? Or maybe yes, not. I okay. do. What's your question? Uh, well, I, um, I've been, uh, going to Boston and going in the middle of Boston and I did see a lot, um, not a lot, but 
I did see a couple of statues and um, yeah. I didn't know, I mean, they weren't that really famous as the ones that uh, we are looking at, but um, I wanted to, to um, ask that how many years it has been for Pistachio was there? Well, this statue, can you hear me, Tanaz? This statue yes. was made in 1884. So that's what, 136 years old? Did I do that math right? Is that 136 years old? So this is, yeah, this right. is yeah. there a long time. And this is funny. When this statue was first put on Harvard's campus, they put it in another spot. And they put it near a big building called Memorial Hall, which used to be the cafeteria. And then when Daniel Chester French was an older man, he said, you know, I'd really like you to move this into the Harvard, the Harvard yard, right into the Harvard yard. And so they did, which was a big project. But the students at the time used to kid around and say they moved the statue away from the cafeteria because the food was so bad and smelled. <laughs> but it was really because Daniel Chester <laughs> French asked them to move it. Okay, we can go to the next, um, we can go to the next statue, Karen. Thank okay. you. Well, I'm just going to tell you one quick story. When I was in college, I was at Harvard visiting, and it was a Friday night, and it was the night before the Dartmouth game, and the Dartmouth student threw green paint on John Harvard, <clears throat> and the Harvard staff were all there to <laughs> wash off all the green paint. Cause uh, Karen, we can't hear you. Oh, I'll t so Karen, K Karen, your voice was soft, but Karen said when she was in college, she visited the um, Harvard statue because she was there for the Harvard Dartmouth game. And a lot of Dartmouth students threw green paint on the statue because green is Dartmouth's color, their school color. So they threw oh. green paint on the statue. And Karen was saying that a lot of the Harvard employees quickly came out and washed it off. Harvard's color is red. So they didn't want any green paint on their statue. That's a funny story. That's a funny story. All right. So now we are at another statue. And before I, before I say anything about this, can you look at the picture on the left and see? I don't know if it, it's kind of in the shade. But what do you notice about this particular statue? Can you notice anything about him? Maybe you can see it in the right picture. What's also in the statue with him? Hey, Julie, I can't see if it was it's blurry to me. In my I eyes. know, so and it's, it's a, we took it in the shade. I'm sorry, we should have taken a better picture. I think I saw somebody's hand. Did I see Adam's yep. hand? Yep, Adam had his hand up. Adam, what do you notice about this picture? I uh, just uh, uh, noticed about some of the, uh, I just saw, Bunch of the other uh, statues that, that was in New York City by the rows, the rows of the other uh, statues. They were kind of right outside. And um, I know that um, it's uh, like a faded, like I think it's. Wendell uh, Phillips. It is Wendell Phillips. Good reading. Good reading. And um, he's standing next to a little, I guess you would call it a podium. You know, when you go to I make a speech, is. if you go to make a speech, you go to a podium. And if, if this weren't in the shade, you could see that he's banging his fist on the podium. What do you think yeah. that means? If somebody's banging his fist on the podium while he's speaking, what does that tell you about his emotion? What's he feeling? Uh, anger. Anger. And yeah, he's very passionate about something. Yeah. And you can't really see it, but in the picture on the right, in his hand, the other hand, you can't see what it is, but those, he's holding a few pieces of broken chain. So that's a symbol for this statue. He's banging on the podium, feeling very passionate about something, and he has some chain in his hand. And also, so, uh, my second thought yeah. is that one, I just, I just even uh, noticed that I just wrote some, something on the chat 
that one of my one of my other uh, colleagues just went, just went to see bunch of the other uh, statues. What was that last sentence you said? One of your colleagues, what? I think it's one of my other uh, colleagues from the other uh, colleges. It just saw uh, both of the other statues. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about this. I'll just tell you a short bit about this guy. But he grew up, Wendell Phillips, as you see, he lived in the 1800s and he grew up in Boston. He went to Boston Latin High School, then he went to Harvard College, then he went to Harvard Law School, and he became a famous, uh, you know, he had a law practice in Boston. But then when he was a young man, one day, this lawyer with a law practice, he went to hear a man by the name of William Lloyd Garrison who used to speak about how horrible slavery was. He talked about it all the time. He was called an abolitionist because he really wanted to end slavery. And so Wendell Phillips said right then and there, that's it. I'm done being a lawyer and for the rest of my life, I dedicate myself to ending slavery, which is what he did. And that's why the chain is in his hand. That symbolizes slavery. And he was working really hard to end slavery in, um, in his lifetime. Okay, we can go to the next one. This is funny. Brian and I never heard of this person before, Robert, um, George Robert White. But we heard that his statue was in the, um, the same part of the Boston Common that Wendell Phillips statue was. So we went to look at it. And this statue is called the Angel of Water. But I will tell you that this man, George Robert White, who also grew up in Boston, when he was a kid, he had to get a job. And um, he got a job at a low, just a nearby store called the um, Potter Drug Company, like the drugstore. And just as a kid, a small kid job, and he just vowed that one day he'd work his way up. And sure enough, by the time he was an older man, he was the president and owner of that company. And he changed the name to Potter Drug and Chemical Corporation. But here's the part that's so funny during our pandemic. Do you know what he made his fortune making? What, what Potter Drug and Chemical Corporation made its fortune making? antibacterial soap, <laughs> which Brian and I, as we sat there in our masks, we thought that was really funny. But he donated, when he died, he donated millions of dollars to the city of Boston. And he said, you can only use this for projects that beautify the city. You can't use it for anything like paving roads or fixing the drainage system or anything like that. You can only use it to make um, to make the city beautiful. So this is in the corner of the Boston Common, if you ever go see it. And it is, in fact, a fountain. OK, next one. And did Daniel it, Chester French do that too? Yes. Can you turn yourself up, Karen? We can't hear you. Oh, the volume is. Um, I have to get closer. Did he, he do that one too? Yep. All of, these, all of these statues are by Daniel Chester French. Okay. And in his life, I should have told you that before. In his life, he made over a, he became the most famous sculptor in the country and he made over a hundred statues and they're in 18 different states and they're in um, Washington DC and he also has a he made a big statue of George Washington that's in Paris France and he made a tablet over in Strasbourg France like to to, to memorize to memorialize um, a war over there but yeah a hundred he just became the most famous sculptor um, just starting with that turnip in Concord. Isn't that <laughs> so funny? <laughs> so, and Brian and I, there are so many in Boston, but Brian and Dan and I only visited the outside ones that we could see easily. We didn't go to any of the ones inside buildings. But this one, I'll tell you real quickly, this is John Boyle O'Reilly. And again, Brian and I didn't know who he was, so we had to look him up. And this is right along the side of the road, just like Wendell Phillips faces out to the road near the common. We have passed it thousands of times and we've passed this one hundreds of times right near Fenway, right near the Museum of Fine Arts. And the story about um, John Boyle O'Reilly, he's up in the upper corner. You see it's a bust. It's just his shoulders and his head. But he was born in Ireland. And he, when he was growing up, he spent some time in England, but he came back to Ireland and he got involved with the Irish army. 
and England did not like that. He got um, in trouble with some of his Irish army friends, so they sentenced him to death. That was the first thing. His first punishment was they were going to sentence him to death. And then they said, wait a minute, we won't do that. Instead, we're going to send him to Australia for 20 years. He's just got to go to Australia and do hard labor for 20 years. So they sent him to Australia, but as soon as he got there, two years later, he escaped and he came to America. And he came specifically to Boston, where he became this very famous Irish American Boston um, citizen. And he became the editor of the pilot, which was a very well known newspaper back then. And he was the person who knew more about and talked about Irish culture and Irish heritage. He was just a very famous Irish man. I see somebody, Ben, were you waving your hand? Ben Bardeen? Somebody was waving their hand. Yes, that, that was me, yes. Did you, what did you, do you have a comment? Yes, well, is this around the time of, as the, uh, as the, as the, uh, I've been listening, um, uh, uh, have you, is this the same time around the, the, the same time as the Boston Deep Sea Party? No, this is after, that's a good question. That was in the 1760s, 1770s, early 1770s. And he, John Boyle lived from 1844 to 1890. So this was like 75 years, 100 years later. This well, was he on the right track at all? Well, he was later, but he, he was so grateful to come to the United States because he thought that he could stand, you know, he was an immigrant and he knew he could make life here as an immigrant. So he's grateful for that. Okay. Now, if you look at the bottom corner, there's another statue on the back. It's funny, there's a statue on each side of this. And the bottom, there's a woman in the middle and her name is Erin, E-R-I-N, which is another name for Ireland. She represents the country of Ireland. And her two sons, they say her two sons are on either side of her. The one who's on the left is her son, the Patriot, the warrior, the Patriot. And the son who's on her right is the son, the poet, because they say Ireland is this blend of patriots and poets. Um, but the reason we took so many pictures is if you look at this, the person who ca carved the marble just put in so many beautiful um, symbols of Ireland. You can see just the the, um, the cross, the, you can see the harps above his head. Those are harps, that's a famous Irish symbol. You can see the Celtic or the Irish cross. So I just thought this was so pretty. Brian and Dan and I spent a long time, you know, Dan's very Irish and our kids are very Irish. So we spent a lot of time talking about this because we've heard so many stories about Dan's ancestors coming over from Ireland and this statue meant a lot to us. All right, so we can go to, we just have a couple more. So this, we're back to Emerson. When Daniel Chester French was a young man, he made that bust of him. But many years later, and this was after Emerson had died, the Concord Library asked him if he would make um, a statue of Emerson to sit in the library. So this is in the main room of the Concord Library when you first, um, when you first walk in. And it's funny because it looks a little bit like Lincoln sitting down at the Lincoln Memorial. It looks a little bit like um, John Harvard sitting down in Harvard Yard. But what's different, if you look at the picture on the left, on Emerson's um, down on the ground, instead of the books that you have at John Harvard's feet, you have a pine branch because his first essay that made him so famous was called Nat Nature. And also the pine branch was, his, the pine tree was his favorite tree. And on the back, of, this was hard for Daniel French to make because Emerson was dead, so he couldn't look, he couldn't go meet with him in person to have him pose for this. Um, so the family let him borrow one of Emerson's big robes. That's what's draped over the back of the chair. So that made him feel close to him when he was making this. But he was also very, um, because Emerson was his friend, he was really nervous about getting it right. He wanted to get it right because he just, it, it had been his good friend. And uh, Emerson was known as the patron saint of the Concord Library and the wise man of Concord. And, and this, by the way, when they dedicated this, um, Daniel Chester French came to the dedication. He didn't always go to his dedications, but he came to this one um, at because the at the library because it, it meant so much to him. Yeah, I don't know. Any, any questions about this? There are so many statues. If you ever walk into the Concord Library, it's one of the most beautiful libraries I've ever been in. And it just opens up a couple of floors and you see all these beautiful statues. And this one, Brian and I were there last year at Christmas time to look at their, they have a very, they're very famous for their um, gingerbread house. So we were there to look at that, but we just couldn't help but notice this, this statue there. 
All right, and now we're back to our first statue. Here we go. Here's the Lincoln Memorial. This is funny. We, this is our family there. A lot of you know, well, you know Brian and me, and I think a lot of you know Maggie, and a lot of you know Evie. And we were down in Washington five years ago to look at a lot of statues. And look at Brian. You can look at Brian, and you can look at me too. You can look at my skin. What can you tell about the day that we were down there? <laughs> we're all sweaty. What do you think about the day? <laughs> It was the hottest day I've ever been in, in um, DC, but we'd driven all the way down there and we wanted to make the most of it. So we were just trekking around to all our statues and we were so sweaty. But this statue, the Lincoln Memorial, Daniel Chester French had spent his life making statues. And when he was 65 years old, when he was thinking about retirement, he was 65 years old, one of his friends, Henry Bacon, called him or got in touch with him and said, listen, I've just been asked to design a building to, to honor Abraham Lincoln in Washington, D.C. I've just been asked to be the architect to design what they want to call the Lincoln Memorial. But I would like a statue of Lincoln to go in it. So would you do this? So this, when he was 65, and it took him into his 70s, this was a big project, um, he made the Lincoln statue. And as you see, he's sitting down. And one thing, we're gonna, you'll see this in the next picture, but just like he always had done, when he got the idea, he made lots of small models out of clay, trying different poses. And then when he found one he liked, he made a three foot model and he played with it a little bit more. And then he found, an, then he made it a seven foot model. So bigger than, you know, the tallest person you know, a little bit bigger. And then I didn't tell you this part before, he would send his models to the Bronx. There was a family there called the Piccarillis. And Mr. and Mrs. Piccarilli had come from Italy and they had six sons, the Piccarilli brothers. And their job was carving marble. And they, they, so they would take Daniel French's design and then they would carve the marble to make the statues. They worked with him all his life. And uh, so this particular statue, the final, it ended up being bigger than, they, than, um, they, than French originally planned. He thought at first a 10 foot statue, but this statue is 19 feet tall and 19 feet wide. So it's about twice as big as he originally planned. It took 175 tons of, of marble from Georgia. And the thing is, it's so big that the Piccarelli brothers made it in 28 pieces and they had to ship the pieces up separately and then they had to put them together when they got to the monument. And for those of you who've been there, there's a, there was a painter <coughs> who painted some murals here and there was an engraver who engraved the Gettysburg Address on one wall and the um, second inauguration speech on another wall. But this was, this was a, uh, Lincoln. And we're going to, if you go um, the next slide, Karen, we'll just take a close up look at a couple things. Mm. So this is, this is from the book, but you see the different sizes. And it's funny, you just see the top of Daniel Chester French's head over on the left. But on the right, the author, the illustrator of this book decided to put the Piccarilli brothers. Let me see if I can find their names. Attilio, Ferraccio, Furio, Getulio, Marcinillo, and Orazio. So those are the brothers. They work together all their life. They're um, carving, it was a whole block in the Bronx, right near Yankee Stadium, I think. And if you go, if you go to the last slide, Karen, <clears throat> one of the things, and, and this, see what, we can look at this, but if you look up close, so whatever time that Daniel Chester French would make a statue, he would do so much research ahead of time. He would read all about the person. He would look at pictures if there were pictures available. He would talk to people who knew the person. He would meet with the person if the person was still alive. And so, you know, when he was asked to make this statue of Lincoln, and he made a lot of statues in Lincoln in his life, including a huge statue of Lincoln in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, but he, when he was planning for this one, he talked to um, Robert Todd Lincoln, Lincoln's living son, and he um, remembered all his childhood memories of Lincoln, because you remember he was about 10 to 15 when the Civil War was going on. And he very purposely designed Lincoln's hands in these two different poses. So if you look at these two different poses, what do you think? What does, the one hand is all clenched up and the other hand is kind of loose. Do, that, do those make you think of anything? If you see somebody with a clenched hand or if you see somebody with a loose hand, 
Does that make you think of anything? Why would Daniel French design him with these two very different hand poses? Any suggestions? I see that we're just about, oh, do you have your hand up, Christopher? Unmute yourself, Christopher. You need to unmute yourself. You okay. Go. You're unmuted. Oh, you're. Uh, he seems like a quiet person. That's why he's, he ends up kind of moving. Maybe he's kind of a quiet person. That's, I think that's one of the hands. On one hand, the hand that's kind of loose, Stop he was tight. gentle and kind, and he wanted to heal the country, and he wanted to gently pull the country back together again after this terrible war. But Ben, what do you think about the fist? Or is that you, Ned? What do you think about the fist? I can't hear you. You have to unmute, honey. Oh, you go. Um, that? Um, hey, Ju Julie, I, I believe that uh, Lincoln Memorial, I believe that's also part of, uh, that's also part of the Smithsonian Museum. That whole stretch. I, uh, yeah, I do, I do think you're right. I think everything's connected. But the fist, we'll just end with that. The fist, he had to be so determined because the country was breaking up and he had to be determined to just really work hard to hold the country together. But they're both sides. One of the famous biographers of him, Carl Sandburg, said he was velvet and steel. You know, he was soft when he needed to be, but he was also, um, also very determined. Velvet and, let me make sure I have that quote exactly right. Yeah, a man of both steel and velvet. All right, so the very last slide that we have for you is Daniel Chester Frank. Oh, no, this is his gravestone. This is funny. This is also in the Shady Hill Cemetery in Concord. And it's so funny because all his big fancy monuments and his gravestone is this very simple rectangle flat to the ground. And his daughter, who grew up to be a sculptor, Margaret, she designed it. And the only words on it, he has his name and his wife's name, because I think they're both buried there. But it says the heritage of beauty. It's very simple. But the design, and here's a close-up of it, is just a wreath, a wreath of laurel, a laurel wreath, I believe. But when people come to visit this, Brian and I, Brian, Dan and I found this in the, the cemetery. And when people come to visit this, they fill in the wreath with pennies. Can you think of why? They put pennies in the wreath. Oh, let me give you a hint. They put a specific side of the penny facing up. Ah. Can you think what's on the back of the penny? Anybody? Nolan has an idea. Nolan, what's on the back of the penny? A Lincoln Memorial. Absolutely. <laughs> so when people come to to recognize and remember Daniel Chester French, they flipped the pennies up and put the Lincoln Memorial facing up because that was yeah. really probably his best known, his best known work. So the last slide is just to tell you that he has, you can still, I know a lot of you have connections to the Berkshires, but he has, his studios are still open out there and I haven't been, but people say it's amazing. And one of the things that he did, he made railroad tracks. He took some railroad tracks that would go out of his studio so that when he was working on something, he could push it outside into the sunlight to see what his statue would look like in the sun. And then he'd bring it in and work on it a little bit more. But we, we have it on our to-do list. We want to go out there. We hear it's a great, um, but who knew? The most famous in sculptor in, in the country was a boy from New Hampshire and Massachusetts, just a couple of towns over. Who knew? So that, that's what yep. we want, Ryan and I wanted to tell you about today. So if there are any other questions, we're happy to answer them. Stop sharing now. And then, are there any questions for Julie? If not, I absolutely have to say that I thoroughly enjoyed learning all about Daniel Chester French. I, I mean, I asked that question, it seemed kind of silly, but I couldn't believe he had done all of these <laughs> statues. Like, is that another one? I just um, discovered this last year. I didn't know that the person who made the Minuteman statue was the same person who made the Lincoln Memorial. I had no idea, let alone that he was from Concord. I think we are all very fortunate to have uh, had this wonderful history lesson. And um, I'm looking to see if, Brian, do you have a question? Yes, I mean, what's tonight looking like for us? 
So um, tonight is um, trivia, isn't it? Trivia, trivia night. <laughs> trivia night. Yeah, right. I'm like, where are we? That's a, I thought we we're having a history question. <laughs> but, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in. Oh, Nolan, you have a question. Yeah, I do. How are you? Good, Bob. I'm doing well. What's your question? My question is, how old was Daniel Finch when he died? Oh, that's a good question. Brian, hand me the book, honey. Uh, he was born in 1850, and he died. Brian and I are looking it up on the timeline right now. Oh, he, he died in hey, wait, um, 1931, so he was 81 years old when he died. Wow. wow. Good question. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, he got a lot done in those 81 years. Wow. He certainly did. Yeah. So as I say, you're going to see more statues inside buildings in Boston once everything opens up again. So there are lots yeah. more done by Daniel Chess. We have the most because, you know, he lived nearby. So no, actually, that's not true. New York has just as many as we do. He had a studio in New York, and um, he has a he had the studio in, in uh, the Berkshires. So in Massachusetts, we have 19 statues, 11 in Boston, two in Cambridge, two in Concord, one in Milford, one in Milton, two in Worcester. And in New York, they have 20. Wow. Uh, mm -hmm. And in DC, they have four. New Hampshire, they have four. Illinois, four, Chicago. So he has them all over the place, yeah. Wow. Super, super. All right, everyone, thank you. I'm gonna unmute everyone, or you can unmute yourselves and say thank you. And thank uh, you. Thank 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 you so much. Another... Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Heffernan. Thank you, Mr. Heffernan. Thank you, Mr. Heffernan. Thank you, Mr. I haven't seen you all in a long time. It's wonderful to see yeah. you. I miss you, Judy. I miss you guys. I miss you too, Sanaz. Yeah, hopefully we'll see each other. I miss you, Judy. How was Ms. Um, uh, how was Ms. Uh, how was Ms. Uh, Maggie? We just went down, um, Adam's asking, he knows that we went down to Philadelphia this past weekend, and um, we saw Maggie and Joel. They just moved down there. Philadelphia, by the way, has three statues by Daniel Chester. Whoa. Yeah. Oh, uh, 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 you know, you know, you we were talking you. about oh, that. Uh, Maggie uh, and Joel uh, and Dan have seen them all. Lord. But they're doing well. They love Philadelphia. Uh, We're yeah, not in Boston, but Philadelphia is their city. Oh, so cool. Uh, hey, yeah, right. Hey. 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 Oh, oh, right. Time to go. See you tonight. Yeah. Bye. Thank Good night. you. Bye. 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 Hi, Nolan. Yes, Hi, Chris. Uh, how are you? Yeah. How you doing? Right. Bye, Bye, Chris. Bye, Karen. Bye, Nolan. See you, Nolan. Yeah. All righty. Bye, Gabby. So does that seem like the kind of thing like that? Does it seem fine? Like, all right. So next it's, week. It was great. Great. All right. Well, this is so Brian and I are going to do one on um, Louise May Alcott and Thoreau and the others for next week. Something similar, maybe a little bit different, but we're trying to figure out what to do with it. But we Oops, have, I guess I should stop recording. Together into something kind of similar. Yeah, and we might also put some scenes.